Hi, and welcome to the chapter 13 lecture for medical terminology. This chapter is a long one. It's all about the female reproductive system, um, gynecology and obstetrics. So gynecology is the study of the female anatomy and obstetrics is the practice surrounding pregnancy and childbirth. And so I've sort of divided this chapter into two lectures. I'm gonna do it in one go but it's sort of divided into two sections. The first, I'm gonna talk about the anatomy, physiology, and diseases of the um, female reproductive system during non-pregnancy. And then I'll talk all about pregnancy and childbirth and diseases and conditions regarding that. <clears throat> so my first term of the day is polymastia and polythelia. So I think I had polymastia on a test one time as a word that like I thought I made up, like ha ha ha, funny condition of many breasts, but it's actually a rare condition that can occur. So if you think about other mammals, like um, cats and dogs and cows, they all have multiple nipples. So humans have, human females have two breasts two lactation glands, um, whereas other mammals have multiple nipples that they lactate through. And so it is not uncommon, or I guess it is uncommon, but, but um, the reason why this sometimes happens, why people sometimes develop extra nipples, a third or fourth nipple, um, is because of this sort of evolutionarily defunct set of genetics that is from our mammalian genetic line um, that codes for these, these mammary glands in a vertical line, two vertical lines down our abdomen. So somebody who has an extra nipple, it's usually somewhere on the abdomen in line with um, their you know, normal, regular nipples. So if you were a fan of the show Friends, Chandler, there's an episode where Chandler reveals that he has a third nipple, an extra nipple. So it, usually there's no breast tissue around it. It's just a nipple. It's kind of like a, like a pimple or a mole or something like that, <clears throat> but it's actually technically um, a nipple. An extra breast can sometimes develop. This is a wood carving where it shows a woman with an extra breast on her leg and a child nursing from it. Whether or not this was a real person is, I don't know. Um, but usually when extra breast tissue develops, it's either below the normal breast or a lot of times it's in the armpit region. Um, and it's just extra um, glandular tissue, so lactating glands, but also that subcutaneous fat tissue. Um, unlike in some fictional situations, like I think it was, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I think there's a character that has three breasts and the third breast is in between the other two. But in real life, if somebody had three breasts, it would be very unlikely to be in the middle. It would be um, developing either under their armpit or under their one of their <clears throat> other breasts or both. So polymastia, condition of many breasts. Polythelia, condition of many nipples, extra nipples. So a little bit of physiology and anatomy of the female reproductive system. Females and males both have internal and external genitalia. So I'm not sure that I went through this very well with the males, but uh, males uh, have more external genitalia than females. The testes and the penis are outside of the abdominal pelvic space. But for females, most of their reproductive organs are internal. The ovaries, the uterus, the vagina are all internal. Um, the external genitalia is known collectively as the vulva, which is sort of just the outer surface of the genitalia. The breasts are also considered part of the reproductive system since they are involved in nurturing the young and also in uh, sexual attraction of, of a mate. So just like in males, the female reproductive system does overlap or really not so much overlap, but is very closely associated with the urinary system, the bladder. So we still will sometimes refer to it to, you know, sort of collectively as the genitourinary system 
or the urogenital system, and females will often see a gynecologist if they are having urinary issues um, because of that close uh, association between the reproductive organs and the urinary organs. So of course the function of the female reproductive system is to reproduce. In females that means to produce eggs and then ultimately to grow a fertilized egg into a baby and then birth the baby and feed the baby from the breasts. So this is a cartoon image of the female reproductive system of the genitalia. So um, this is a mm, coronal, no, sagittal section. So cutting through someone down their nose and looking in. So you can see half of the reproductive tract. So you can see one of the ovaries here. Um, that's this white egg-like thing. And then this pinkish tube with the little finger-like thing sticking off. This is the fallopian tubes. The fallopian tube is like a duct that carries the egg to the uterus. And you can see here how muscular the uterus is. It's really just a thick, thick muscular organ. And it needs to be muscular because ultimately its ultimate job is to push a fully grown baby out. And so it does need to be very strong and muscular in that sense. Um, when there's no baby in there, it's re re really small. And um, you can see the intrauterine cavity here. Uh, the neck of the uterus right here, we'll see is called the cervix. There's the cervical opening. Here's the vaginal canal or the vagina. And here's the vaginal introitus, which is the opening of the vagina. You can see how the vagina is very close to the bladder right here. And here's the urethra and the urethral meatus, the opening the pee hole. So you can see how the urethral meatus and the vaginal introitus are very close together. Um, and it's why we talked about in a previous chapter that females are much more prone to bladder infections or urinary tract infections because bacteria that normally reside in the vagina can get into, or even in the anus, can get into the urethra and take up residence there and cause problems. Um, the female organ of sexual arousal is the clitoris. Externally, you can only see a very small part of it, but there's actually quite a bit more of the internal structure. Um, and here's the rectum on the posterior side. So you can see that the vagina is basically sandwiched between the rectum and the bladder. And sometimes during traumatic labor, if the baby really tears up the vagina on the way out, you can get problems that we'll talk about like rectocele or cystocele, where parts of either the rectum or, or bladder herniate into the vagina. Um, another thing I just wanted to point out on this slide is that the fallopian tubes and ovary together as a pair are sometimes referred to as the adnexa. You might see that in like a medical report. The yeah, adnexa look normal. All right, so let's start with the ovaries. The ovaries are the female gonads. They are the seed producing organ. Gano means seed. And they produce eggs. In fact, females are born with uh, ovaries full of immature eggs. And when they reach puberty, those eggs actually start to mature one at a time. And one egg at a time is, is released a month. One mature egg is released each month, um, alternating the different ovaries. Some women actually will, will pop two eggs at a time, one from each ovary, and that's when you get people who are prone to fraternal twins. Um, but unlike sperm, which are sort of generated new and can be generated sort of endlessly, ovaries, there's sort of a finite number of eggs that a woman has. And... Um, beyond a certain age, she really isn't isn't able to mature any more of her eggs. There, she's pretty much used up all the eggs. So um, the egg, the medical term for egg is an ovum. That's singular. Ova is plural. And there's little sort of cells or divisions, spaces in the ovary that are called follicles. And within the follicles, that's where you find the immature ova that will re 
mature into mature ova and be ovulated or released from the ovary and into the fallopian tube. The ovaries, just like the testicles, the testes in males, they are the gonads, they produce the seed, but they also are part of the endocrine system and they are glands that secrete hormones. So the hormones that the ovary secretes, the three biggest ones are estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone. So estradiol or estrogen we'll talk about is the you know, main female hormone, but testosterone is also produced to a small amount, not nearly as much as the testes produce. Um, this is an anterior view of the reproductive system. So we can see the shape of the uterus from the front. So we saw in the previous picture that it's sort of tilted forward. So it's in this case, tilting toward us. You can see that there's two ovaries and there's two fallopian tubes that connect to those two or attach to those two ovaries. You can also see several ligaments and fibrous tissue that's holding the uterus up and keeping it suspended within the uterine cavity. There's something we'll talk about called uterine prolapse, where if these ligaments tear, the uterus can actually sort of collapse and it can herniate and actually poke out of of the vagina poke through or fall into the vagina and then that has to be surgically repaired. You have to do a pexy, a hysteropexy to fix it back in place. Um, all right, so we talked about the ovaries. They make the seeds, the ova, and then they um, ovulate. So the mature egg is popped out of the ovary and into the fallopian tube and the fallopian tube carries that egg to the uterus where it may potentially implant and grow into a fetus. So the parts of the fallopian tubes, these finger-like extensions here are called the fimbriae. And this sort of open chamber, the sort of fat wide part here at the end is called the infundibulum. So the egg is released. The fimbriae actually help to keep the egg and scoop the egg into the fallopian tube, into the infundibulum and then it travels down the fallopian tube. So fallopian is actually an eponym um, named after, I think an Italian anatomist who first described them. Um, another medical term for this piece of anatomy is just to call them the uterine tubes. And the uterine tubes function very much like the vas deferens. It's just a long tube that carries something from one part of the reproductive system to the other. In fact, in the fetus, the if you um, develop male genitalia, then that piece of tissue becomes the vas deferens. But if the fetus develops female genitalia, that same piece of anatomy develops into the uterine tubes. So basically, same piece of anatomy repurposed based on genitalia. Um, within the inner lining of the uterine tubes, there the cells themselves have cilia and cilia are like little eyelashes on cells that move and help to push things. So we talked about way, way, way back in chapter four that there's cilia in the respiratory tract that helps to push mucus up and out. All right, there's mucus also produced to lubricate the reproductive tract and the cilia help to move that along and also to move the egg along to their ultimate location of the uterus. So the uterus is pictured here. It's often described as a pear-shaped organ. All right, so there's this large fat part here, which is called the corpus. There's a dome-shaped part, which is the fundus. We've also seen fundus in other organs like the stomach and the bladder. Um, and then this narrow part down here is the cervix of the uterus. Cervico just means neck. So the cervix of the uterus is the neck of the uterus. Um, the cervix, over here, there's an opening into the cervix, into the intrauterine space here at the top of the vagina, and that's called the cervical os, O-S. So os is just a, yet another term for an opening. So we've had the urethral meatus, the ureteral orifices, the cervical os, and then at the opening of the vagina is called the vaginal introitus. So there's four different terms, anatomical terms for an opening to a canal. Um, 
The top of the vagina is also known as the fornix or the vaginal vault. I think of like vaulted ceiling. So it's really the ceiling of the vagina here. Um, you can also nicely see the different layers of the uterus. <clears throat> So we can see the endometrium here is like a sort of deep red color. And then you see this fibrous pink area. This is the myometrium, the mus muscular layer of the uterus. And then on the outside, it almost looks like it's covered in this membrane. And that's the parametrium. So the outer lining of the uterus. So these three different layers are listed here on this slide. Metrio, by the way, is one of the combining forms for uterus. Utero is also a combining form, and we'll also see hystero in a lot of the surgical procedures having to do with the uterus, like a hysterectomy. So the parametrium, peri means perimeter or around, so it's the outer part. Myo means muscle, so that's the muscular part of the uterus. And the endometrium, oops, that inner lining is the one that's actually shed every month when somebody has their period. It's, um, it thickens in anticipation of implantation of a fertilized egg. And if no fertilized egg is implanted, then it's shed and we start all over again. <clears throat> um, that they remember the uterus does tip forward and that forward tipping is called antiflexion. It literally means forward bending. Um, and that's actually important for the uterus to, to sit like that because it allows the, the baby to grow forward when the fetus is developing during pregnancy. It grows forward in the abdomen as opposed to um, sort of upward or backward into the abdominal space where it can really get in the way of other organs and cause a lot of pain. Um, <clears throat> all right, the vagina is the next part. So if we're going sort of in well, we're following the course of maybe um, an egg. Uh, so the egg goes from the ovary, then through the fallopian tubes into the uterus. If we kept going through the female reproductive tract. We would then enter the vagina. So the vagina is what connects to the uterus. Um, and it's a, a long canal. It's an internal part of the anatomy. A lot of times people refer to this external area as the vagina, which is incorrect. That's technically the vulva. The vagina is the internal part of the organ. The opening is called the vaginal introitus. There's also a thin membrane um, that women, that girls are born with that's called a hymen. And the hymen is broke, broken at some point. Um, oftentimes it's broken during the first sexual intercourse. And when it's broken, it bleeds and it leads to some bleeding that's common the first time a female has sex. But it can also be broken from trauma. Um, like if you are riding a horse or riding a bike or something like that, and you get basically just get kicked in the vagina really hard, you can break your, break your hymen. Um, tampons can also break the hymen. And so some women don't bleed the first time they have sexual intercourse because they've already broken their hymen and may or may not know that they did. Um, but that's a piece of anatomy to know regarding the female reproductive tract. So this is the external genitalia of females, the vulva, all right? And the vulva has parts. There's the mons pubis, which is literally means in Latin a mountain of pubic hair. Um, the external labia, the labia majora, which are covered in hair. And the labia minora, which have less hair. Um, you can see here the clitoris, the organ of sexual, sexual arousal. This here is the urethral meatus, the pee hole. And here is the vaginal introitus, the entrance to the vagina. And this is the perineum, the patch of skin that's between the genitals and the anus. And then here's the anus. And you can see the, the wrinkling from the sphincter, the external anal, anal sphincter there. So collectively, the external genitalia is referred to as the vulva. Um, the perineum, by the way, this little spot between the genitals and the anus, so in females between the vagina and the anus, and in males between the scrotum and the anus is called the perineum, not to be confused with the peritoneum, 
which is that membrane that holds everything into the abdominopelvic cavity. All right, and also not to be confused with the parametrium, which is the outer lining of the uterus. So those are three terms you might want to star in your notes and make sure that you can keep straight the difference between the perineum, the peritoneum, and the parametrium. All right, and then the last part of the female reproductive system that we'll talk about are the breasts. So the breasts are consist of two, mostly two types of tissue. So subcutaneous fat tissue, which is in yellow here, and glandular tissue, the lactiferous lobules or the milk glands that produce milk. And then the milk is transferred through these ducts through out of holes in the nipple. So these milk ducts are very much anatomically, they're very much like sweat glands. So um, when you sweat, you sort of involuntarily release sweat from your sweat glands. Well, milk can be the same way. Um, the main way that milk is released is through massage of these ducts, which is, you know, think of, you know, milking a cow, but also when a baby suckles. Um, but also mm. some women just will leak milk out. They just basically sweat it out of their nipples because there's no sphincter or muscles that control the flow of milk. It's really just um, through manual massage by the baby's mouth that the milk is ejected. But it's made in these lobules here, these milk glands, and flows through the milk ducts out of holes in the nipple. And I think the nipple has something like six to nine holes on average for these ducts. Lacto, by the way, means milk. So lactiferous lobule literally means a milk producing um, lobule or like ball. Um, the breast tissue develops during puberty. So <clears throat> male breasts and female breasts are similar up until puberty and then they develop the, the hormones, puberty hormones send more fat tissue to the breast and also um, encourage the development of those lactiferous lobules. So a little bit of physiology of sexual maturity of puberty. So puberty in males and females is triggered by the same hormones that are secreted from the brain, from the pituitary gland. And those hormones are FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone. So the follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the follicles of the, the ovary to start making the eggs mature. So it leads to egg maturation. And luteinizing hormone stimulates the uh, hormone production by the ovaries. So the three hormones that are produced in greatest amount by the ovaries are estradiol or estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So estra is actually a combining form that means female. So estrogen, estradiol, like it's the major female hormone. Progesterone, whereas testosterone, on the other hand, is an androgen. It's a male hormone, all right? Females still make testosterone, just much smaller amounts. There are still androgens produced by the ovaries. Progesterone, also female <clears throat> specific, and it literally means before pregnancy. So progesterone is produced in preparation for a fertilized egg to implant. And if it does, then the progesterone keeps going. So it's sort of the pregnancy hormone. Oh, and this is my lame joke about FSH. What do you what do you call a fish with no eyes? A fish. F S H. Get it? No eye. <laughs> okay. Um, this is just a slide showing you the different effects on the body of the hormones of puberty. So the ovary, when it's stimulated at puberty, it will produce estrogen, which leads, that's the main female hormone of puberty. So you can see there's a lot of different things that it affects. Hair growth, breast development, hip development, um, deposition of fat. It uh, circles back and signals the ovary to help the eggs mature properly. Um, progesterone is really for pregnancy. It prepares the body for pregnancy every month. So it goes up and down, up and down, unless you get pregnant and then it stays up. And also testosterone, which is responsible for hair growth and sex drive. Um, 
So the menstrual cycle. So when females hit puberty, they start having periods. Uh, these, the medical term for periods is menses, which is really from the Latin word for months because it happens every month. The first period is called menarche. And um, age at menarche is an important piece of historical medical information for women to know um, that can be indicative of different hormonal issues and whatnot. So, the, so menarche is not just a special sentimental date for females, but it's also medically relevant. Um, <clears throat> so the menstrual cycle, this is a really busy diagram but it's also really rich in information so it's showing us what happens in the female body over the course of a month 28 days in the ovaries in the body temperature um, so the ovaries both within the follicle looking at the maturing ovum and also at the hormone levels at the body temperature and what's going on in the endometrium the inner lining of the uterus all right so day one of the menstrual cycle is day one of your period. So the first day that you start bleeding. And so what's happening when you're bleeding on your period is that inner lining of the uterus, the endometrium has actually died and is shedding. So, <clears throat> um, so it falls away. So that first week or so, the endometrium is shedding, a new follicle is starting, just starting to mature in the ovary to be um, try again the next month. Your estrogen levels are pretty low during your period. All right, at the end of your period, after about a week, all right, your estrogen levels go up. And that leads to further development of um, immature follicle in the ovary. It also starts to lead to a thickening of the endometrial lining of the uterus. So when the estrogen peaks, that's when ovulation occurs. So that follicle ruptures and it spits out that mature ovum, the mature egg. And when that happens, you get a dip in estrogen production and you get an increase in progesterone. You also get an increase in basal body temperature, like a half a degree. So some women who are trying to conceive and are trying to map their cycle will actually um, to keep track of their basal body temperature. And when they see that little increase, it's a sign to them that they're ovulating. So when you ovulate, that's the best time to try to get pregnant because you have a fresh mature egg that's just ready to be fertilized. Um, and over the next few days, it'll start to travel down the fallopian tubes where it hopes maybe that it'll meet a sperm and become fertilized, or maybe it hopes not to meet a sperm and to just be fated to die in the uterus. But during its travel, all right, progesterone uh, levels increase, and that really helps to increase the thickness of the endometrial lining and really get it nice and thick so that if that egg gets fertilized, it has a cushy place to implant in. All right, so now the egg presumably has reached the uterus, and but it doesn't implant because it's not fertilized. And so if it's not fertilized, it doesn't implant, it just kind of dies there in the uterus, and the uterus starts to die as well. Not, not the whole uterus, but the endometrial lining. All right, this is called the ischemic phase. So basically, blood flow is cut to the endometrium, and it starts to die off, basically, that's that layer. And then it starts to flake away, and we end up in the menstrual phase again, All right? The Hormones, the progesterone, by the way, up here is produced by that dying follicle. So the ruptured follicle that spit out the egg is now called the corpus luteum, and it's actually secreting that progesterone. And if uh, at the end there, when there's no implantation, the progesterone goes back down. So it's being made in before pregnancy in anticipation of readying the uterus for pregnancy. But if no egg implants, if no fertilized egg implants, no pregnancy occurs. And we go back to the period. So some diseases and conditions that can affect the gynecological organs, menstrual disorders. So someone who doesn't have a period, we would say has amenorrhea. Um, a is a prefix that means without. 
Rhea means excessive flow, so or flow or discharge, and meno is monthly. So amenorrhea means without monthly flow. And this can happen for a number of reasons. It can be hormonal. It can be nutritional, caloric. Uh, if you're not getting enough calories to run all of the energy needs that your body has. In females, the first thing that the female body will basically shut down if it doesn't have enough energy is the reproductive system. Because if you think about it, logically, if you don't have enough, if you're not getting enough calories to fuel your own needs, how are you gonna be able to fuel the growth of a fetus? So the first sort of, the, it's not, a, it's not a, a vital function, reproduction. So it's the first thing that gets sort of shut off when you're trying to conserve energy. So um, it's not uncommon for girls with eating disorders or even who are very athletic and are burning a lot of calories and, and are just not able to consume enough to lose their period and suffer from a period of amenorrhea. Um, <clears throat> dysmenorrhea is a painful, abnormally painful monthly flow. So people who have really debilitating cramps. So the uterus, when it's shedding the endometrium, it often does contract, the muscle will contract and spasm a little bit, and that can be painful. Um, and that can range from mild uh, discomfort to severe like labor-like pains. And so um, that's referred to as dysmenorrhea. Menopause is pause to stop or cease the monthlies. So this is what happens in later in life, like late 40s, early 50s, you start to transition where the ovaries are not making as much of these different um, female hormones and you stop having a period, you stop producing, you stop ovulating. Um, there's no mature eggs left and you stop ovulating and you eventually stop having a period. Um, so females do have a, a window of their life where they are fertile and can reproduce. Men do not, men, once they hit puberty, they're basically, their reproductive system is good till the end. They're maybe not quite as healthy, not quite as, as fertile um, as they get into their later years, but men don't go through a similar sort of menopause. They don't stop producing sperm the way women stop producing eggs. Menorrhagia is excessive flow. So menorrhagia can be associated with dysmenorrhea. Sometimes if you have a very heavy flow, chances are you also have more painful cramps, but they don't necessarily go hand in hand. But menorrhagia would be someone who has very heavy flow. And one of the downsides of that is you can become very anemic. You can lose a lot of blood and um, actually become iron deficient and anemic. So um, menorrhagia can be uh, not just um, annoying and unpleasant, but also can be a medical issue. Oligomenorrhea would be the opposite. That would be having very scanty periods. I'm not really sure how that's a disease or just like a lucky condition of people who have light periods. Um, some other diseases and conditions, now looking at the ovaries and the uterine tubes. Anovulation is a condition without ovulating. Again, this can be related to hormonal imbalances. Um, sometimes people are not ovulating, but they still have a period. So um, it's not always obvious if you're not ovulating. If you have amenorrhea, you also have anovulation. If you're not getting a period, you're not ovulating. But if you're not ovulating, you may still be getting a period. So sometimes women who think that they don't have fertility issues because they get a period regularly find out that they're actually not ovulating regularly. Um, and this is common in uh, people with something called polycystic ovarian syndrome um, or PCOS for polycystic ovary syndrome. And in PCOS, there's these little tiny cysts that develop on the ovaries. So they're not the kind of cysts that become large and swollen and painful and rupture. Um, that's another issue of the ovary, but these are little small cysts that actually are testosterone producing. And so they mess with that, the levels of hormones and, um, and prevent ovulation. 
So people with polycystic ovary disease often need fertility treatments to help them conceive. Ovarian cancer would be cancer of the ovaries. Salpingitis, salpingo is a combining form for uterine tubes or fallopian tubes. So this would be inflammation or infection of the uterine tubes. Some conditions of the uterus. Um, you can have conditions that affect the endometrium, that inner lining of the uterus. Endometrial cancer is a type of cancer. You can also have other types of uterine cancers that affect like the myometrium. This is a condition I like to highlight, endometriosis. So endometriosis is this strange, not well understood condition where the endometrium, bits of the endometrium, the inner lining of the uterus, escape the uterus and enter the abdominal cavity and start growing on organs in the abdomen. Um, and it causes abdominal pain and it's often different in different people because where that tissue decides to insert itself and grow is different. A lot of times endometrial pain is cyclical, so it, it um, occurs with your cycle. So you may, you know, be in pain, you know, once a month, every month. Um, <clears throat> it's very difficult to diagnose because again, A, the pain can be in different places um, in different people. It also is oftentimes it has similar symptoms to something like um, more common things like sexually transmitted infections. Uh, and so a lot of times people will be misdiagnosed as having a sexually transmitted infection. Um, you, there's no diagnostic test to look for endometriosis. You can't see that endometrial tissue in the abdominal space using an x-ray or um, an endoscopy or uh, an MRI. And so the way that it's diagnosed, unfortunately, is it's called a diagnosis by, uh, I can't remember it, um, where you rule out other things. It'll come to me like after I'm done recording. So kind of like if you ever watched the show House, um, that's how do doctors work by doing something called a differential diagnosis. So they, they take your symptoms and they list all the different things that it could be. And then maybe they narrow down ones they really think it is and they do tests. They do tests to rule out these other things. So with endometriosis, they have to do all these tests to rule out other stuff. And, um, and if they can't find any other cause for your pain, then they say it must be endometriosis. So there's no actual um, test that tests for it. It's a, it's a diagnosis by exclusion, I think maybe is what it's called. So you're, you're ruling out all these other causes. So um, I know a couple of people in my life who had endometriosis and they had it for years before it was properly diagnosed and it caused them a lot of pain. Um, one of them even ended up going to the hospital because she was in so much pain. She thought like her appendix burst or something. Um, <clears throat> so, but the tests that they did, they had to do a culture for uh, for chlamydia and gonorrhea to look for sexually transmitted infections. They did endoscopy, so they were looking for issue and colonoscopy actually to look for um, issues maybe in the rectum or in the intestines. Um, <clears throat> and I think there was one other thing they may have done, maybe some other intestinal test, like an MRI maybe to look for tumors. And when they couldn't find any other cause of it, they said, okay, it, it might be endometriosis. And the only way to diagnose this is to do surgery, is to actually open the patient up and look for that endometrial tissue. And so it's called an exploratory laparotomy where they open you up to explore, but usually when they do that, they have a pretty good idea they're gonna find what they're looking for. And so that exploratory laparotomy turns into a therapeutic laparotomy where they're actually treating you. So the treatment is to go in uh, laparoscopically, um, and to find, using a camera, those, those rogue pieces of endometrial tissue and use a laser to blast them, basically. Sometimes people with endometriosis, especially if they're older and they're, they're done having babies, 
they may just do a hysterectomy and remove the uterus entirely because even if they ablate the rogue endometrial tissue, it can happen again. So people who had a history of endometriosis can develop it again. Um, and But at least usually they, they know what the symptoms are, what to keep an eye out for. So hopefully it gets diagnosed quicker the second time. Um, other diseases of the uterus, so that was endometrial issues. Uh, this is a picture of a leiomyoma, a tumor of the muscle tissue of the uterus. A, leiomyo, a leiomyoma would be a non-cancerous tumor, and a leiomyosarcoma is a cancerous tumor. Um, the treatment would hopefully be a hysterectomy, um, but if that cancer is metastatic, if it has spread at all, then additional chemotherapy and radiation might be necessary as well. Myometritis would be an infection of the muscle. Pyometritis would be pus in the uterus, so that goes along with an infection. Uh, uterine prolapse is what I was talking about before, where if those ligaments tear and the uterus drops or falls basically into the vaginal canal, that's uterine prolapse. And this can happen, it's not that uncommon to happen after a particularly traumatic childbirth, so a really large baby, or even not even that large of a baby, can weaken the muscles or the ligaments around the uterus during um, labor. Um, retroflexion or retroversion of the uterus is the improper positioning of the uterus. So remember the normal position is anti-flexed, bent forward. Retroversion is sticking sort of straight up, so it's sticking back from where it should be. And retroflexion is when it's tipped backwards. And these two positions can lead to very uncomfortable pregnancy where the uterus sits very much on the spine, leans on the spine and pushes on the spine and can be um, painful and some, sometimes debilitating. Uh, the conditions of the cervix, the neck of the uterus. This is actually a view into the vagina. So this metal thing here is a tool called a speculum and it basically creates an opening for the doctor to view the cervix. So a lot of sexually transmitted infections, including HPV, human papillomavirus, can sort of show up. You can see the signs of it on the uterus as the, if the uterus is, or sorry, the cervix is inflamed. So the cervix should be sort of uniformly pink in color, but you can see these red splotches here on this one, which is a sign of cervical dysplasia or abnormal growth. And cervical cancer, is very commonly caused by human papillomavirus HPV. And a simple test to look for and screen for cervical cancer is a pap smear, where basically they take like, um, like a Q-tip, like a pipe cleaner kind of a thing, and just take a sample of cells, just swipe, um, like scrape some cells off the cervix there, and then they put it on a slide in the lab and a pathologist looks at the cells on the slide to see whether they look cancerous or not. <clears throat> um, this procedure that we're looking at here in this picture is actually a colposcopy, which is just the procedure to view the vagina. Colpo is a combining form that means vagina and scopy, a process of examining using a scope of some kind. Um, some conditions that affect the vagina and the and potentially the perineum. Dyspareunia, we've seen this term before, it means difficult or painful sex, condition of difficult or painful sexual intercourse. And this can be due to um, vaginitis, just inflammation of the vagina from irritants. It could be from sexually transmitted infections. It could be from uh, any number of things. Cystocele and rectocele are what I was talking about earlier with um, if there's damage to the vaginal wall during labor, the bladder or the rectum could herniate into the vagina. Those would need to be repaired surgically by repairing the wall of the vagina using sutures. So the procedure to suture the wall of the vagina is called a colporophy, and I spelled it wrong here because it should be R-R-H, colporophy. Um, vaginitis would be inflammation of the vagina, and candidiasis 
is the medical term for a yeast infection. The yeast, the type of yeast that normally resides in the vagina is called candida albicans. And so candidiasis literally means just a condition of yeast, which is really more correct than to say a yeast infection in a way, because an infection is sort of like bacteria where they're not supposed to be. But yeast are supposed to be in the vagina. The problem is if they overgrow, they can cause discomfort and extra vaginal discharge. And so there's antifungals that you can take to get the yeast population back under control. Candidiasis is very common in females after taking antibiotics, which kill the bacteria, a lot of bacteria in the body, and including normal bacteria that live in the vagina. It does not kill yeast. And so you can imagine all of its uh, bacterial neighbors are dying off and the yeast decides to take over the neighborhood and you end up with an overgrowth. Some conditions of the breasts. Breast cancer can arise, and there's different types of breast cancer depending on which type of tissue that it um, develops from, but normally breast cancer usually is occurring in those lactiferous lobules, the glandular tissue. Um, you can also have fibrocystic disease, so there are fibrocysts that can form in the breast and they feel like a tumor, so the breast cancers are hard tumors. You can feel them and, and females are encouraged to do regular breast checks to check for tumors. Um, but sometimes, and especially certain times of the month, you'll get these fibrous cysts that form that feel like tumors, but are not and are not something to worry about. Um, Failure of things having to do with actual milk production, which maybe would be better in the second part of the lecture when I talk about pregnancy and labor and babies. All right, so lactation is milk production. So a failure of lactation would be when um, a new mother, their, their milk just doesn't come in. Their breast tissue, their mammary glands fail to produce milk. Nowadays, uh, we live in time, you know, modern science, we have really nutritionally adequate baby formula, lots of different types of baby formulas. And so we don't need to feed our babies breast milk. But a hundred years ago, we did not have baby formula. And as it turns out, milk from cows or goats or other animals is really not sufficient for babies to feed on and thrive. It's lacking certain nutrients that they need. And so it used to be if a woman had a failure to lactate, either her baby would die or she had to find a wet nurse. She had to find some other breastfeeding woman to feed her child as well. Um, so it's really fortunate that we live in a time with formula. There's people sometimes have bad things to say about formula versus breastfeeding, but we're really lucky to have that option when there's the medical condition of not being able to produce milk. Galactorrhea is excessive milk production, and sometimes it occurs um, not with labor. So somebody who just starts producing milk, even though they didn't have a baby, uh, would be experiencing galactorrhea. This is just showing you some, uh, some laboratory and diagnostic procedures. We talked about the pap smear where, so they use a spec speculum, this metal tool here to open up the vagina so they can get a, a good view and also, um, reach the cervix with one of these three different types of brushes, I guess, to get a um, sample of cells to smear onto a slide and look at, the pathologist will look at, at the cells to determine whether they're cancerous or precancerous or normal. Pap smear is short for Papa Nicolau. So it was a Greek doctor who invented this procedure. And in some countries, they actually still call it a Papa Nicolau test. And they don't abbreviate it like we do. Some other procedures that can be done, you can have a hysterosalpingography. So let's break this down. Hystero is uterus, salpingo is uterine tube or fallopian tube, and graphy or ography is a procedure to take a recording. So potentially someone who's maybe having trouble conceiving um, and they don't know why, 
the doctor may perform a hysterosalpingography, to, so a procedure to look at the uterus and the fallopian tubes to make sure that they're intact, that there aren't fibroids or there aren't, you know, blockages or things that are impairing fertility. A mammography is a procedure to take a recording of the breast tissue to look for breast cancer. Colposcopy, a process of viewing, using an instrument to view the vagina. Cryosurgery can be done sort of on the vulva if there's like genital warts or something uh, using cold to remove surface growths. A hysterectomy is a procedure to remove the, surgically remove the uterus. And a laparoscopy is a procedure to view inside the abdomen. So a lot of procedures now are done laparoscopically. So hysterectomies are laparoscopic procedures now. So once upon a time, to remove a woman's uterus, they would make a large incision um, and remove the uterus through that. But now, along with other internal organs that can be removed this way, they do the surgery laparoscopically. So they make several small incisions, three, three small incisions, usually one in the belly button for the scope, and then two small ones on the side here, one for, um, uh, actually both of them for their instruments. All right, so there's a camera in here that's shining on the, a light on the organ, and then they have two holes where they can go in with their tools, their little snippets, their scissors, and um, and actually cut and remove the uterus. So the uterus is too large to actually pull through one of these holes. So what they do is they cut the ligaments that hold the uterus there, and then they actually pull it out through the vagina. Um, but these surgeries heal up much faster because there's small incisions that need to heal rather than a large incision. A myomectomy would be removal of a part of the muscle of the uterus to remove a smooth muscle tumor. An oophorectomy is surgical removal of the ovary. So if you're having both ovaries removed, it would be a bilateral oophorectomy. Salpingectomy is removal of the uterine tubes. All right, so like the whole thing. The type of salpingectomy that's usually done is similar to a vasectomy. So we call that a tubal ligation. So a tubal ligation is when they sort of take a little piece of the fallopian tube out and then seal the ends so that you can still ovulate, but the egg can't get to the uterus because you've cut off like that bridge. It's very similar to a vasectomy. It's the female version of a vasectomy. The colloquial term for the procedure is to say that somebody's tubes are tied. And the story I always tell here is my parents are divorced and my dad got remarried when I was like 12 or 13. And I was at summer camp and you know, my parents wrote me letters when I, I was at sleepaway camp for like a month. And my dad would write me these letters and my dad's very businesslike and he'd, he, he's an accountant. And so he would type his letters at work on like his work letterhead and he always like just just wrote letters in like a very businessy kind of formal language and i just remember one letter that he sent me and he said that uh you know he was just informing me that my stepmom was having her tubes tied and you know on this this in such and such date and she's she's fine surgery was successful and i just remember reading the letter and thinking why are you telling me this I don't want to know that my stepmother is getting birth control surgery. Like, I don't need to know what you guys are doing that in bed. Like, just that's private. I didn't want to know that. I think he was just trying to inform me, you know, your stepmom had surgery, but don't worry. She's fine. But all I read, all I heard was your stepmom and I want to have lots of sex and not have any babies. So he wasn't um, in my headspace <clears throat> when he wrote that letter. Um, there is a reversal for that procedure. You can get a tubal anastomosis, just like there's a reversal for a vasectomy. Um, and, but both of those surgeries, usually people get it with the intention of not reversing it, but there is always that ability to reverse it if one so chooses. Some surgical procedures of the breast. Breast augmentation, or, or sorry, mammoplasty procedures 
are procedures to reshape the breast. So you can either shape them to be larger, to be smaller, or to be perkier. So they can be um, enhanced, that's called a breast augmentation. They can be shrunk, that's called a breast reduction, or they can be lifted and fixed in place. So that's not adding any volume, but simply lifting them um, in place. So that's called a mastopexy. In the case of breast cancer, a lot of times breast tissue is removed. Surgical removal of the, of the breast is a mastectomy. So mammoplasty can be done as an elective, um, elective procedure, cosmetic procedure, but it can also be done in a thera sort of more therapeutically. For instance, in the case of women who have mastectomies and their breasts are removed um, and their breasts are then you know, malformed, and they can be reshaped and returned to um, a, a more pre-cancer stage using mammoplasty. So mammoplasty has, has been an important therapeutic procedure for women who have undergone mastectomies and not only go through the scare of cancer, but also go, have to go through suffering the loss and change of a critical feminine piece of their anatomy. All right, so that concludes the gynecology portion. Now for the obstetrics portion. Hell, I'll stop and start again. Bye.